When it comes to TV provided entertainment, I tend to be a son of the 90s. Disney's and Warner Bros. cartoon renaissance, Sam Raimi's produced serials, and the occasional schlock of EXTREME proportions. These were my weekly media consumptions growing up in the decade of corn dogs, hammer time pants, and the influx of universal uncertainties and geopolitical chaos brought upon by the end of the Cold War, which relegated the last 10 years of the past millennium in a state of existential emptiness associated with a worrying lack of cultural substance. So anyway, the 1980s. My occasional foray into the media offerings of the decade that first monetized the concept of nostalgia mostly consists on shows like DuckTales, various anime that were imported at the time, and occasionally something like He-Man and the Masters of the Universe would pop up in my radar. And speaking of cheaply made toy commercials with high concept science fantasy settings but less than stellar execution, let's talk about a semi forgotten cartoon that may very well be considered a prototypical He Man in terms of both presentation and budget. It's called Thundar the Barbarian! Yes, that. After miraculously surviving the terror of the attack of the Scooby clones, also known as the 70s, the American animation industry was about to just kill over and die. What would ultimately save it from its economical demise, ironically, was the concept of turning cartoons into glorified infomercials for associated toys, a trend that became actionable during the Reagan administration. Unfortunately, right before that, Thundar the Barbarian had already ended its run, 24 episodes in between 1980 and 1982, and couldn't quite capitalize on that sweet, sweet action figure profit. Or at least it couldn't up until, curiously enough, the year of 2004, when an actual show-inspired toy line was produced. Two decades too late, I might add. Anyhow, other than being the direct ancestor to Filmation's He-Man, Thundar the Barbarian is the kind of show that serves as an ideal pop-cultural mashup that best represents the very specific period of time in which it came out, by wearing its obvious inspirations on the proverbial sleeve. That is especially on point once you get a marginal look at the three main characters. A blonde chosen one protagonist with a literal lightsaber. His fabulous sun sword. Assassin non specific princess that's mostly useful and only occasionally gets kidnapped. Come out wherever you are. Thunder! And Chewbacca. No, seriously, show's creator Steve Gerber was forced by the NBC network to add a Wookiee-like character in the series because Star Wars was popular. As for the plot itself... The year 1994. From out of space comes a runaway planet, hurtling between the Earth and the Moon. Man's civilization is cast in ruin. Two thousand years later, Earth is reborn, but one man bursts his bonds to fight for justice. <laughs> Hmm, a post-apocalyptic high fantasy science fiction hybrid with anthropomorphic animals, enslaved humans, and a blonde warrior supermodel rising to liberate mankind. Where have I heard that before? It's Kamandi. It literally just is the premise of Kamandi, the last boy on Earth. They aren't even trying to hide it, are they? Legendary comic book artist and writer Jack Kirby, who made Kamandi, by the way, worked on the production design of the show. So it cannot be just a coincidence. Now, to be fair, I mentioned how Thunder, etc., etc., has a tendency to wear its pop cultural references like a model on a catwalk. According to the official wiki article, the cartoon drew major inspirations from the likes of Conan the Barbarian, which is showing, Flesh Garden, and Thor. Command itself comes off as a mashup of different genres, styles, pulp comics, and also, very obviously, Planet of the Apes. 
Therefore, even though the show is openly derivative beyond the expected levels of derivativeness that all fiction has, it still manages to be charming and creative in its own right. For example, the very idea of placing the post-apocalyptic element of its digestis not just on the foreground of the aesthetic presentation, but as the epicenter of the narrative as a whole, it's something that not even thematically bold modern-day cartoon had the guts to fully embrace. Every episode showcases a different remnant of our civilization that only serves to remind the young audience about the millions of people who died in the Great Cataclysm. In that sense, the beautifully drawn backgrounds do a great job in conveying a feeling of desolation alternated with the more colorful palette from the fantasy aspect of this science fantasy opus. On top of that, there is an intriguing, albeit terribly underdeveloped, element of sorcery mixed in with super science that grants a unique feel to the show. Do all these cosmetically pleasing choices make up for a serious built around a main character that looks like a fusion between Luke Skywalker and Yor, the hunter from the future? All of you, draw closer. I'll show you a wonder of wonders. I've hinted this before, but for all the ambition that this digestis exudes, there are just as many problems to be found in the execution, which is not surprising, again, considering the time period. No. That's way too easy. A typical episode of THUNDER opens up with our intrepid weekly saviors of humanity accidentally stumbling upon the plot, usually involving some magical MacGuffin or the wreckaged remains of something that existed back in the 20th century, with Dupe Skywalker charging blindly towards the danger while swatting his sword around as if he was trying to distract a cat, Princess Ariel phoning in the obligatory pun Looks like it's up to me to blaze the trail! occasionally forgetting that she's supposed to be a powerful sorcerer whenever it's dramatically convenient, and not Chewbacca growling and generally looking bemused the entire time. Unfortunately, that's really all you need to know about this character's personality, or tragic lack thereof, as there is little to nothing else happening in between the many, many, many action scenes throughout the show. <laughs> Having an action-oriented cartoon in 1980 has to be considered an extremely bold move, considering Ruby Spears Productions did not have the budget to pull it off. And it shows, every step of the way. Someone, something, is coming. I'm firing my laser! There are well-known shortcuts to animate these types of sequences that old-school anime made famous, such as super-quick zooming and panning of still images with dynamic lines of movement, or just skipping frames. The shortcuts they ended up using here, on the other hand, didn't work very well. They relied too heavily on painfully obvious reused clips and bare minimum animation cycles, thus dooming the cartoon at its very core. It's a shame, really, considering it had surprisingly creative ideas that could rival the best episodes of classic Star Trek and Doctor Who. Case in point, the villain from the first episode ends up bringing to life the Statue of Freaking Liberty to literally squash every human alive! An allegory for the corruption of democracy and the American dream? In a children's cartoon from the 1980s? You have got to respect that, at the very least. Perhaps I should make this as clear as possible. In spite of its problems, all derived by the limitations imposed by the time period, by the way, this is an entertaining show. And not just for the obvious reasons that most cartoons from this decade could be considered entertaining. It was creative. It was bold. It pushed the boundaries of what Saturday morning's lineups could offer to their young audience, and, for better or for worse, 
it paved the way for much more known and successful programs that would take the 80s by storm. Sure, it looks stylistically quaint by today's standards, and its episode-by-episode -episode narrative formula of FIND CONFLICT, FIGHT BAD GUYS, SAVE HUMANITY gets old and repetitive real fast, but honestly, Ruby Spears Productions did the best they could with the means they had. Thunder the Barbarian might have been a product of its era, but in a period of time dominated by terrible animated adaptations of live-action TV shows, Scooby-Doo clones, and a veritable bankruptcy of new ideas, it was easily the best product of said era. All of you, draw closer. I'll show you a wonder of wonders. Yeah, this is still ridiculous, though. Can you handle the ship, Ugla? <laughs>